And we're live. This is happening. How are we doing, boys and girls in the chat? Uh, yeah, I just had to rescue the uh, the spare modem from the back of the cupboard to uh, make sure we had some internet tonight. Uh, so we are up and running. Everything seems to be loud and clear. Don't so, spend all your internet ration in one place. <laughs> yeah. Fuck everybody that's home. <laughs> Fuck them all. Uh, so it's me and it's Hobbit. So this is technically, I think we could call this series three, season three of uh, 14 words, couldn't we, Hobbit? But season one was K, but season two was zero. Season three, it's me and you. You know what? Hang on, hang on, just a minute. There we go. Sorry, the voice in the background. I should put my headphones on for this. I hope you could start to season three and a half. Away well, you've, from you've, you've, imp you've improved your mic. We can't even, oh, Hobbit, you have improved your mic. You're not spe you're not coming to us live from the bottom of a bucket anymore, are you? Uh, it it swings and roundabouts, you know. I improved the mic, but I don't want to wear headphones because it cramps my style. <laughs> it musses your hair, does it, Hobbit? Oh yeah, and we've all got to look good during our quarantine period. <laughs> ah, right. So, um, well, should we should we carry on with our warm open as we do? Uh, so I've got from unexplainedmysteries.com. Uh, I'll just bring this in the chat for you, Hobbit, so you can follow us in general. Ah, everything's gone silent. <sighs> no, it's all... What? Can you hear me? Hobby tool. Hobby. There we go. Now I now I can hear things. <laughs> I did plug... I, I plugged the microphone... Uh, the microphone. I've plugged in my... Um, Headphones, there we go. I knew what there was a thing it's called. <laughs> this is going smoothly today, isn't it, mate? Isn't it just? <laughs> oh, no, there's a term for this in your new age thing. When Mercury's in retrograde, communications are affected. So any astronomers, <laughs> tell me, is Mercury in retrograde at the moment? Say yes. Uh, so, uh, bit of a git, because April Fool's Day was Wednesday, so I had Grub and Glory was the day before and this is the day after um so does any do you know the origins of april fool's day please do enlighten me oh dear fellow old chapo chum uh so we celebrated each year by pulling pranks on one another but nobody's quite sure where it all started so do you remember the have you ever seen the swiss spaghetti harvest on paranorama have you ever seen that one yeah, I, I did see you know, that uh, the spaghetti is half stood from the spaghetti tree. <laughs> uh, was it? Apparently, next Netflix did a public service announcement warning its users about the dangers of bin binge watching. Um, oh ha ha! What a prank! Uh, and then we and then we all did last year with the J JJLE, didn't we? With K voice for, a, <laughs> for an hour. Uh, that that was hard. <laughs> And throbbing. Uh, so, what does it say here? Uh, turns out nobody knows when it was when it was originated. Great article there. <laughs> and unexplained mysteries. Uh, well, I mean, it would be it's living up to the name of unexplained mysteries as opposed to uh, mysteries. What we explain shouldn't it be explained mysteries? Uh, one theory is that it came from a nun's priest's tale. One of the stories in Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. In it, one of the characters, the Chaun Chaunticleer, is tricked by a fox on Sin March Began, 30 Days and Two, which some believe is a reference to April the 1st. Uh, so what does it say? In France, the first known mention of April Fool's Day was supposed to be 1508 by French, po po polit French poet El Eloy Damaval, who referenced... Poisson d'Avril, which relates to Fish of April. Uh, others believe that the day originated in the Middle Ages when New Year's Day was sometimes celebrated between March 25th and beginning of April. It's thought that people who celebrated New Year on January the 1st were mocked for it, thus the idea of April Fool's Day was born. Did you know any I mean, of that, Hobbit? I could sort of understand, like, saying, oh, it's really New Year when the weather starts to get warmer again, so... Yeah, that sounds plausible. I like that one. Yeah, it's uh, 
I don't think it's really us that celebrates uh, the 1st of April because that's kind of ta- end of the tax year, isn't it? Yeah, it's... <laughs> I don't it's think it was really, ethnic yeah. Brits that used to celebrate that day, was it? <laughs> y- yeah, yeah. April Fool's, I'm just pretending to pay tax. Yeah. Uh, so, um, is there a scientific ex- explanation for deja vu, Hobbit? Please say no. I thought you were going to do the. Oh, I thought wait, you were going to do the bit, Hobbit. I knew you were going to say that. I thought that's wait, what you're going to. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, there, there is a science science explanation for this, right? What's happening is, is, and I've I've alluded to this very before, where you've get um, creatives get like visions from the future. So deja vu is a more mundane version of that, where you experience. I say mundane. <laughs> A mundane thing is like, it's happening to you right now. Oh, I've already been here before. This has already happened. Which is kind of interesting. What's the French for deja vu, Hobbit? Already seen. <laughs> is that what they say? They say, I've had a bit of already seen. Is that what they say? Literally, uh, it's, that's, that's already seen. That's, that's <laughs> what they're saying. <laughs> Over the years, there have been numerous unofficial explanations for deja vu, ranging from a glitch in the matrix to recalling an experience from a past life. But is there official scientific answer? A uh, number of studies have attempted to recreate deja vu and demand under laboratory conditions. Well, how can you? Because it's like completely random, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. It just uh, it's it's not saying that's going to work on testing method method. I suppose the only thing you could do is make notes of in what circumstances does it happen to what people and see if there's a correlation. <gasps> correlation. But it's weird but it's weird because like you you could go like months or even years between deja vu's, can't you? They're not like regular, are they? Well I certainly don't no, get them first, regular. The first time it happened to me I was about fourteen years old and I was in a home economics class and uh it was it was quite str- strange. It was something about doing tie dye cloth. The weirdest one I ever had was I I'd, I was watching an um, watching an episode of uh, EastEnders with my then girlfriend, and I'd actually seen every, uh, and I could actually like recount every single bit in EastEnders. But I don't know whether that's because EastEnders is a re- repetitive or whether it was actual deja vu. <laughs> I, I get that. I'm watching a lot of movies and I'm like, I know what's going to happen next. Yeah. No, but this was like, I could tell, I could tell when, when it, at what character was going to deliver what lines. It was just really, really odd. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, what, I mean, again, that's deja vu and that's the weird thing. How it's, it's extraordinary and mundane is at the same time. And useless. <laughs> Well, useless. An interesting quirk, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Williams has said he's got a lifetime of paranormal activity. The British chart topper, this is some proper paper talk, this isn't it? The British chart topper has had a long history of experiences with UFOs and paranormal phenomena. Uh, what's he say here? So he's gained a lot of attention over the years. UFO stories, because there's, um, what's his name about the Trogs? Didn't he form some sort of UFO group? Who? No, I don't, why again, I don't know a little about UFO groups. Ah, uh, right, you, you know, um, you, do you, you know the Trogs did well thing, and, uh. Really? I thought that was, um, Purple Haze. No, that was the Trogs. Well, you learn something every day. <laughs> Well, anyway, the dude out there. So I think I think also he wrote that. What's that song that uh, Wet 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 were number one for weeks from that film with Hugh Grant on it? Uh, was it Four Seasons? Four Seasons in One Day. Uh, Smiling as the shit comes down. Oh, I've, ne- I've nearly got. I've nearly got it, Hobbit. <laughs> it's right. It's right there. Da, 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 do you remember that one? I feel it in my fingers. I feel yeah. it in my toes. <laughs> oh, no, fuck. I can't get the song. Oh, bollocks. Uh, but, I mean, it's literally... Love is all around me. Love is all around me. He, um, anyway. Um, 
dude who wrote dude who wrote that and wild thing he's a big ufo nut and i think uh he start i think he used some of the some of the cash from that wet 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 number one to start a ufo group or something like that i tell you what a weird one is right and it's this very specific song which you, when you hear it you, you know the name of it is a 1950s one and i think he's using a theremin or something it's a it's kind of sort of pop, early pop song from the 50s or 60s. And it was named after this uh, communication satellite, like Telefec or Telerefric or something like that. And mm. it's one of those songs which is like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. But it never gets played on the radio. And there was this um, Irish gobshite, Thomas Sheridan, who was listening to it. He was doing this uh, documentary about that song. And um, the very next day I heard it on the radio. I just happened to be listening to the radio, and there it was. Ooh. Yeah, it's funny how synchronicities like that happen, isn't it? Synchronicities, I like to think, is the world's way of just saying that it's alive <laughs> and it's alive. Poo world, poo world one, which I suspect is probably corrupt. Love is all around, love is all around, love is all fucking around. <laughs> Some insistence we talk about GIF, but... Um... You know, I'm, I'm interested in this as well. It's pronounced Jeff. We're, we're doing this is this is what we call this is what we call a warm opening where we talk talk oh, crap first. Oh, is is it like with? Um, I mean, the thing is, it's an animated GIF, right? I, if anyone calls it GIF, I'm just like, no, you're not English. Yeah, but it's actually pronounced Jeff. Then why is it not written Jeff? Because uh, it's on the Isle of Man. Even the girl's name's like a what? Manx name. It's. Is this like with um, with Jeffrey written Godfrey? And it fucking hell, did you know? Godfrey? Did you know Robbie Williams has been on Coast to Coast AM? What with George Norrie? I don't know. Who does it now? Well, I mean, it was George Norrie and it was Art Bell, but Art Bell died. He was even in. Apparently, Robbie Williams was in the running to buy the uh, Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch. Um. Okay. Is so he, he said, like a, fr- a Freemason or a Scientologist? Is he one of those weird fraternities? Not as far as I know. I mean, he just got bummed by Jewish execs, I suppose. Well, I mean, that's bad enough. <laughs> I mean, that's the worst fraternity of them all. I mean, the benefits is, is what? Yeah. A lifetime of drug abuse. Do you think Michael Jackson was in that fraternity? Quite possibly. I think it was his dad that did that to him, wasn't it? Yeah, I get a feeling his dad and... Uh, well, never mind. That's that's for another show, isn't it? So, GIF. Uh, right, so I've t- just got one more to do. Um, talking about Linda Blair from The Exorcist. Are you a fan of The Exorcist, Hobbit? I saw it once. Yeah, same here. I watched it at a midnight showing at the cinema. The girl, the girl I took to it fell asleep. <laughs> oh God, how spooky! <laughs> so, uh, when it was released, the original Axis, blah blah blah. When shooting began in 1972, a fire tore through the set of Reagan McNeil's home, causing extensive damage. In a peculiar twist, the room used for the actual exorcism scenes escaped unscathed. Um, actors Jack Mc. Gowan of Vasiliki Maleras both died shortly after the film had wrapped and both Linda Blair and Max von Sydow suffered the loss of close family members during shooting Jason Miller's son nearly died in a motorcycle accident and and several actors were injured on set one of those who suffered injury was Linda Blair herself who during filming had been strapped into a special contraption designed to flail her body around to make her appear possessed one day during filming, the lacing that was designed to support her came loose, leaving her flying around so violently she fractured her lower spine and was left in agony. Blair herself can be seen speaking out about the incident in the clip from new docuseries Cursed Films, which explores some of the stories behind famous movie curses. Oh, uh, for- I hope they do the crow then. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's pretty cursed, isn't it? Uh, what's it? Isn't, the Omen- isn't the Omen another one that's quite cursed? Well, I, I find it interesting that both Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee's son die from film accidents when uh, they had a curse put on them by the, uh, the the secret Chinky Society. 
I've just got I've just got to read this one out because it's Uranus is leaking atmospheric gases into space. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know, but I've stopped eating garlic, so hopefully that should correct myself. New analysis of data, of data, is this, oh, the, oh fuck, this is the uh, April Fool's episode, it's the April Fool's story, isn't it? I mean, the thing is, all all planets do vent off so Oh no, this was him. posted on Friday the 27th of March, how can this not be the April Fool's story? I mean, what, are they saying there's a weakening of its magnetosphere? Because that's the only thing which could account for it. So it says the phenomenon is essentially a pocket of the planet's atmosphere that is being funneled away into space by its magnetic field, a process known as at atmospheric escape. Do you know what that is? Uh, yeah, again, atmospheric escape. You've got solar wind constantly pushing on the uh, on the planets. On Uranus. They have a... Ma yeah, well, yeah, Uranus... Um, Neptune, Venus, all of them, they're all, got, they're, they're all being pushed on by the sun, and um, which is farting out solar wind at tremendous velocity. And if the magnetosphere is not strong enough, the atmosphere gets stripped away, and there can be fluctuations in the magnetosphere. So that the, uh, Uranus's uh, magnetosphere is fluctuating. Is Why are you calling it Uranus, I bet? Because, uh, ah... We're not yet at the stage where we're going to rename it Eurectum. <laughs> Eurectum. Do you remember Future Armor? Mm. <laughs> Uranus. Uranus, I bet. If you want to. If you want to. U Uranus. Uranu. Yeah. Uvavu. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are 30 year old boomer posting. Yeah, we are, aren't we? Uh, so there we go. So that are you, are you finished talking about um, atmospheres and Uranus? So Geff, the talking donkey. You want to go talking donkey? <laughs> nice. Oh dear. <laughs> so I, I found I found one while I was looking for stuff like this. I also heard something about. Have you ever heard of Mike, the headless chicken? I did hear about that. The chicken lived for many months after it was In the 1940s, where an ordinary chicken survived for 18 months with no head after being cut off with an axe. I guess that gives the phrase, run around like a headless chicken. Yeah, well, apparently that's what they do, don't they? They, like, twitch and fucking run around and stuff, don't they? Just goes to show that there's not really much going on in their little bird brains, and most of it's just autonomous. Yeah. So, uh, so Geff, Geff, or Jeff, as he's, as it should be pronounced. Uh, right. So, let's have a look at this. I seize it how I seize it, mate. You're gonna call him Geff, then, are you? He was the uh, you know named after that uh, that music label Geffen Records. Geffen Records. <laughs> Ah, uh, so right. So in the 1930s, you've got you've got something that's called the Dol the Dolby Spook. That's because it's in oh, where's the fucking area? Oh, well, there you go. It's part of the high fi industry. It's it's Dol Dolby and Nike yeah. stereo spook. <laughs> so it's uh, because it's in the located in Cashin's Gap near the hamlet of Dolby on the on the Isle of Man. Yeah, very stereo. This one, isn't it? Cashin's Gap. What I mean. Cashin's okay, Gap. Right. It's just Cashin's Gap. Yeah. Gaping Gap. Gaping Gap. So what exactly oh. was the Dolby the Dolby Spook? Uh, so the Dolby Scoot Spook was. Uh, you know, the Dolby Scoop Spook was a mongoose called Geff or Jeff. So, so, for members of the audience who aren't familiar, i.e. me, what's a yeah. mongoose? <laughs> a mongoose? It's like a stoat or a weasel, isn't it? So you want to go this basic, then? You want me to tell you what a mongoose is? Yeah, I, I didn't know. I mean, I thought it was like that, that animal in Canada with the big antlers. No, that's a moose. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like an Indian thing, isn't it? Uh, so, mongoose is a common English name for 29 of 34 species in the family Herpestidae, which comprises four genera. They're a small carnivorous, na 
They are sm small carnivorans native to southern Eurasia and mainland Africa. The remaining species of this family are native to Africa and comprise four cousamans in the genus Crossarchus and meerkat. So they're similar to a me they're like They're like a meerkat, stoat, weasel kind of thing. All right. I mean, if, as long as I got sort of go along thinking, yeah, it's a foxy stoat, then I'll be all right. It's a foxy stoat. <laughs> so, it, so it is neither a mong or a goose. <laughs> it's a bit of both. <laughs> so anyway, so Geff, where's the fucking bit that I was looking for? I got, I got all this ready, and it's all fucking disappeared now. I got you saying it now. Yeah, what's that? Geff, the talking stoat. Geff. So, right, so, family, a family called the Irvins lived, lived in... Lived, lived in... Uh, oh, fucking hell, this is garbage. Uh, so, September 1931, the, Ir the Irving family cons consisted of James, Margaret, and a 13-year-old daughter named... V <laughs> You're going to love this name. Vware. So it's V-O-I-R-E-Y, which apparently is the Manx for Mary. Claim they heard persistent scratching, rustling, and vocal noises behind the farm farmhouse's wooden panel, wooden wall panels that various that variously resembled a ferret, a dog, or a baby. That's, does that depend on which angle you're looking at it? Ferret, a dog, or a baby. I mean, <laughs> what sort of noise? I mean, I know kittens can mimic the sound of a crying baby, and it's quite uncanny how close it. Uh, one of those things that screech in the middle of the night is that bustards, is it? That, that's cats. Oh, foxes! Foxes scream like a woman, don't they? Oh yeah, yeah. They they got a, a certain sort of dry hacking scream, haven't they? Mm. So, according to the Irvings, a creature named Jeff introduced itself and told him he was a mongoose born in New Delhi in India in 1852. So this is in 1931. So this this was a thirty odd year old <laughs> ferret. As as it's um, not a uh... sorry, man. as it's not a um, an, an English foxy stoat, and it's a ma ma Manx one. I was going to say Mancunian, but that's not Isle of Man. A bit but further it's over, Mongoose, therefore it's Indian. So, <laughs> so it would be like, hello, my name is Gif. I am a talking mongoose. Booga, booga. <laughs> no, wait, wait. He's from India. Yeah. Hello, I am. I am. Please to be meeting you. How do you do? <laughs> please do to be meeting you. Have a cup of tea. <laughs> I would like a cup of tea, please. Does he drink tea? Uh, I don't know. I don't think. Um, I think he had he had tea. And, he had biscuits and stuff like that. What were his favourite biscuits? Penguins. <laughs> Penguins. I don't know. They eat snakes, I, don't they? Um, they yeah, eat snakes, they don't do. they? Mongooses. Hey, cobras. Because have you ever heard that? Biscuits. Have you ever heard that folk story about the guy that goes out hunting, comes back, finds the, um, goes into the nursery, finds um, the whole nursery is over, can't, it's t has been turned over, can't find the baby, so he sees the dog with um, blood round its mouth, takes the dog, out, takes the dog out and kills it. So then he tidies up the nursery, dips it over to find out the the dog, the dog had actually killed a wolf and saved the baby. Cool. So he actually felt. I like that artwork uh, slideshow you got going on there. You like that, there. do you? These are um, these are all pictures of uh, Geff. Uh, you, you got me doing it now, Jeff. <laughs> I, I just I, I saw you know the, the hand paint. There we go, Geff! Exclamation mark. The strange tale of an extra special talking mongoose by Christopher <laughs> Josephi. So these are these are pictures of um, supposedly pictures of Jeff. And the farmhouse and stuff like that that I've found. Uh, where's the, this one I need to read a bit off. The sun's got... So, um, so, when they were, so they were sitting down to dinner one autumn evening when they heard spitting and growling sounds coming from behind, behind the walls. As the days went on, the noises were more akin to, to a child singing nursery rhymes. Then as the family say, the culprit introduced himself. He was a talking mo mongoose named Jeff. It may sound extremely far-fetched, but in 1931, the Irvins, who lived in a remote farmhouse called Cashin's Gap on the Isle of Man, believed they were ta they were haunted by a talking mongoose. Um, 
So theories that were thrown out about th- thrown around thrown around about Jeff. Well, he was a figment of their imagination. He was a mongoose that had been possessed by a poltergeist or a real talking am- animal. Um, so the story kind of got everybody going. Um, several ghost hunters and jur- journalists have been been involved, such as I haven't heard of any of these. I bet Zero has. Uh, obviously, Harry Price we've heard of because we spoke about him in the Borley Rectory episode, if you remember that far back, Hobbit. I do remember that one. Yeah, Harry Price. Someone called Harrowwood Carrington. Who is um, he's a British-born American investigator of psychic phenomena and an author. His subjects included several of the most high-profile cases of the apparent psychic ability of his times, and he wrote over 100 books on subjects including the paranormal, psychic research, conjuring and stage magic, and alternative medicine. There was also a fellow called uh, Nandor Fodor, who was a Hungarian, He's, he he got he was interested in it as well, but I Fodor. think Fodor, Fod Nandor Fodor, Fodor. But Harry Price was the only person to actually go there. Uh, so what else happened there? So he said some pretty interesting things. He said, "I am extra extra clever, but not always kind." <laughs> uh, initially, initially they thought. They thought that uh, the sounds coming from the halls were rats, because apparently their their cottage it was um, it's brick, and then there's a gap to hold heat, and then there's wood. So there's plenty of um, room for stuff to live in there. So Jim laid down the traps and poison. The noises noises continued. One day he tried to scare the creature by growling at the wall like a dog, and to his surprise, it growled right back at him. Soon it was singing nursery rhymes in an eerie childlike manner before coming out and introducing itself a few a few a few days later. Uh worry 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 I don't know. Describe the creature as being it's the size of No, it's it's the Manx for Mary, so it's a girl. Oh, okay, we'll call her Mary then. I'll we'll call her Mary. Mary described the creature as being the size of a small rat with yellow fur and a large bushy tail. So it sounds a bit like Pikachu. <laughs> that had poke- we've solved it. That had a Pokemon in the wall. I, I was just going to say, are oh, mongoose known for mimicry? No, but Pikachu is. <laughs> Detective Pikachu. They should have called it Detective Pikachu, shouldn't they? That's it. We, we've solved the case. We can wrap this one up. Right, job, <laughs> job's in. I just no, need Ash, need Ash in there with his collecting ball or whatever it's called. No, tune in uh, for, for the next 14 words. We'll start where we'll solve another thing. So the animal said it was a mongo- mongoose called Jeff who'd been born in New Delhi, India, was then hunted before escaping to the Mile- Isle of Man. Uh, didn't really say how he got to the Isle of Man. <laughs> Bus? Do you think train? Say, is there like a, a frequent um, freight route between the Isle of Man and India? Because as far as I know, like it either comes from Ireland or, or uh, Liverpool, the freight to... Um, What's the principal port in the Isle of Man? Uh, I don't actually know. Should we look into? Should we have a look at the Isle of Man? I'm just going on Google Maps now. <laughs> I want to say it's Ramsey. No, it's Douglas. Uh... Yeah, it's Douglas Harbour. Uh, is it anywhere near Close. Liverpool? It's not far, is it? Well, Douglas, um, the closest thing is Haysham. Uh, that's just due east, and Liverpool is, is southeast. Hmm. So, do you reckon he uh, thumbed, the lift on, thumbed the lift on a boat? On a, on a boat? I mean, is there any stories of like any scowls that's going like, yeah, I remember this this talking mongoose. It's, yeah, his name was Geff. I know, I was like, what do you mean? I thought it's called Jeff. No, it's Geff. He's Indian. <laughs> is it? Maybe, maybe, maybe Jeff should have talked like that. Did, did you did you appreciate my attempt at scowls? That was not bad. Yeah, didn't Jeff talk more like this, Robert? I can't go anyway, that high. Anyway, I don't want... He told them, I'm an earthbound spirit. I'm the ghost in the form of a monkey. 
<laughs> that was a so, chip, but yes. We'll, we'll, ju we'll just assume, you know, Gif was uh, an enterprising mongoose and was able to <laughs> negotiate international waters. And find his, uh, he, so he found his way into the Isle of Man. Yeah, <laughs> somehow. Well, was he a fan of, of motorcycles, perchance? I mean, all I know about the Isle of Man is... Do you think he went there, do think he went there for the TT, then? Is that what you think of it? I mean, that's the only reason anyone goes to the Isle of Man. Nigel I think, Manson, think George Formby took him there. What was he into uh, the motorbikes? Oh, there's a there's one of the George Formby films is one where he does the TT. Nice. Mm. Uh, so where was I? So he told him he was an earthbound spirit and the ghost in the form of a mongoose. However, more chillingly, he warned that he was extra extra clever, but not always kind. Initially, Jeff assumed the role of being a pet that also took on household jobs. The, Ir the Irvings said Jeff did guarded their house, let them know guests were arriving, told people that if if one of them left the fire on before going downstairs to put it out. So he's kind of like, it, it's weird, isn't it? He's, he's like part poltergeist, part, um, brown, is it brownie? Brownies are the house spirits, aren't they? He's like, yeah, yeah, he does sound like a brownie. Yeah. Well, he was from India. Badush. Badush. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> Not that sort of brownie. Uh, so anyway, what what Jeff would do is Jeff would well, often lose I his temper. At, Jeff would often lose his temper at the Irvings. He called Jim a fat-headed gnome and then even threatened to kill them all. Oh well, there you go. He's a brownie, and of course the gnomes are the guard, the guardians of the garden. So that is, is the that, nemesis of, of the brownie. Is it? Is there some like into? In, uh, do you reckon like brownies are racist? That like, racist towards gnomes? Then is what it is. I think it's a bit of tribal conflict between the little people. You've got the hob, you've got hobbits, you've got gnomes, you've got brownies, and of course you've got the fairies as well. They're each each other's throats. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder who's the little uh, goblin of that. Well, there we go. I'll just answer it. The goblin's the goblin yeah. of their kind. <laughs> uh, worry. By the way, the Golden. chat's asking, did uh, Geff ever make it to Speaker's Corner? <laughs> is, this, is, this, is that some sort of joke? Is that some sort of in-joke that I, that I probably do actually get? Well, I'm thinking Ralph made it to Speaker's Corner, and he was <laughs> two fools from New York. <laughs> I'm thinking that's where that joke's going. Yeah. So look, Paul, 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 Paul World is jumping the gun here. So I shan't read that chat out yet. So Vari was scared of Jeff, Jeff, and kept slept in her parents' bed to avoid being alone in the dark with him. However, the mongoose didn't take kindly to this, telling Jim, "I'll follow you where, uh, follow her wherever you put her." One night when the family tried to barricade the bedroom door with chairs and boxes so he couldn't get in, Jeff, Jeff, made the, Jeff made the door bulge until it crushed open. He That's a bit weird, the it? door? Yeah, bulged it. So... So, like, the wood splintered or, like, the wood turned plastic and bent? I don't know. It just says Jeff made the door bulge until it crushed open. So he does I'm, sound I'm like he's a sort of fairy or something, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, so, someone that's uh, some creature that's able to manipulate wood and make it deform like that, that's supernatural. Yeah. That's a bit like with the, the, with the crop circles, where the stalks of wheat are bent down, but they're not broken and snapped. Yeah. So, reporting the local paper alerted members of the public to the strange events. It wasn't long before paranormal investigators and national and international reporters descended on Cashin's Gap to catch a glimpse of the mysterious mongoose. Although he usually only appeared to the Irvings, a couple of reporters claimed to have seen Jeff, with one even telling his boss that the creature had given him a tip for the races. Other visitors said they could hear strange voices echoing through the walls. Many paranormal investigators said this was like to be poltergeist activity connected to the teenager of worry. Um, so skeptics accused worry of ventriloquism saying the odd noises and voices seem to have come from where she was standing 
Um, that's also a bit like the Enfield haunting as well, isn't it? Because they accused the girl of do- doing that as well, didn't they? Interesting. Uh, so, footprints and stains on the wall and hair samples claimed by the family to be concrete evidence of, of Jeff were identified as belonging to the Irwin sheepdog. And they were accused of deception. One psychologist who stayed with the Irvins for a week said he didn't believe the family were deceitful, putting Jeff down to Jim having a split personality. Uh, another theory is that the family had developed mental health problems due to the circumstances. One rich, once rich and living in Wavertree, Liverpool, they'd moved to Cashin's Gap after Jim's piano importing business collapsed. Uh, the house had no electricity and no telephone. The family who didn't fit in with the locals that only had a family, uh, haven't had a gramophone for entertainment, were extremely isolated. That seems a bit weird, though, like getting skint and moving to an island. Yeah, know. I mean, if I don't know. I mean, what, they, they thought it was going to reduce the cost of living? Or they wanted yeah. to get out of the city because they, they were in debt to someone dangerous, maybe? Yeah, seems like that, doesn't it? In July 1930, well, but then again, if you're on the high, on on the run from a gangster, you wouldn't make something this something like this and become famous, would you? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> kind of weird. Very, the whole thing's really weird because it's not a standard poltergeist. It's very, it's just like, it's a really interesting story, isn't it? There's there's a few oddities in there, that's for sure. Yeah. In July 1935, well-known paranormal investigator Harry Price went to Cashin's Gap and later published a book called The Haunting of Cashin's Gap. He avoided saying that he believed the story and never encountered Jeff himself, but also admitted he could not find a motive for the family of to, to have lied about the events. I agree that the whole family must be mixed up in it, but there still remains the question of a motive. It certainly is not to draw people to Cashin's Gap because they do, do their utmost to keep them away. The motive for the imposture lies much deeper than mere publicity, he wrote at the time. So when Jim, so when Jim died in 1945, Margaret and Varey left the home and moved to the mainland, selling the farm to a man called Leslie Graham. In, strangely, in 1947, Leslie trapped and killed an animal that seemed neither ferret stoat nor weasel, adding that it matched descriptions of Jeff. So a few years on, he too left Cashin's Gap and the fort, and the farmhouse was, and the farmhouse was uh, demolished. So a, as an adult, she maintained the family's foot story had been true. She never, cr- she apparently she never cracked. She never changed her story. Come <laughs> find some money at this mother. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great, no, it's, def- it's a good story because it's interesting, isn't it? And there's no deathbed recanting of it either. No, she went. She went to her grave, not changing her story. Well, I'm inclined to believe her then. So I got some more bits and bobs about Jeff. So, so when he became part of the family, it said he he became more than a pet. He became a member of the family itself. Jeff happily feasted on biscuits, chocolate, and bananas. Jeff often helped around the house, turning off stoves accidentally left on. Awaking over sleepers and that kind of thing. This he d- this does sound all fine and dandy, but there was a darker, more sinister side to the animal. He would often boast or brag that he was the eighth wonder of the world. He was an extra clever mongoose. Um, I'm trying to find there's some other funny stuff that he said. Well, so if basically, he was the wonder of the world. Then why not have you know, um, say, invite everyone to have a look at me and marvel at how clever I am? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of, it sounds weird, doesn't it? Because apparently, as well, I'm trying to find the bit. Apparently, he used to, he used to take buses around the island and talk. To, talk to the, he used to talk to the bus driver and Nicky's lunch. <laughs> so, in other words, there should be other witnesses that collaborate. Like, oh yeah, we remember the talking mongoose Geff from yeah. that farm, from that That's... place where no one talked to them because they weren't part of us. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Uh, so the, the Manx people, I, they, I mean, I can't shine a candle to the racism of the Manx people. They, they, they make me even feel like I'm not white. <laughs> so uh, some of the stuff he said, uh, said he was an earthbound spirit, and he said he was a ghost in the form of a mongoose. And he once said, I'm a freak, I have hands and feet, but if you saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned to a stone or a pillar of salt. Uh, apparently he guarded... 
He guarded their house and informed them of approaching guests or unfamiliar dogs. Uh, uh, Jeff would go down and t- stop the stove. Ermin's clothes, Jeff would wake people up. Uh, whenever mice got into the house, Jeff would supposedly assume the role of a cat, although preferred to scare them rather than kill them. Uh, food was left for him in a, su- in a saucer suspended from the ceiling, which he took when he thought no one was watching. Irving's claim the mongoose regularly accomp- accompanied them on trips to the market, but always stayed on the other side of the hedges, ch- chatting incessantly. It seems weird how they kind you- of uh, how they blame the father for it, isn't it? I was going to ask: Have you ever um, set out food for um, mythical creatures? Because I know there's that tradition of a mince pie and a glass of sherry for uh, Father Christmas and his reindeer. Yeah. Because reindeer love mince pies. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a talking mongoose like? Um, chocolate digestives or chocolate <laughs> hobnobs? Hobnobs. I, I, I don't think there's a mythical creature about that doesn't like a hobnob. No, I mean, the, show me a creature that doesn't like the chocolate hobnob and I'll say that's a demon. Oh, yeah, that, this is the one. Um <laughs> Je- Jeff was said to speak phrases in English, French, German, Yiddish, Spanish, Flemish, and Hebrew. <laughs> Are you getting a bit more suspicious about Jeff now? Uh, I'm, I'm now starting to wonder. Uh, there's something different about Yiddish. Isn't it? Yiddish is some sort of slang, isn't it? Is it a German what? Hebrew mix? It's. It's, um, I mean, I assume it's Hebrew because of those that speak it, but it's an Eastern European language. Uh, I don't know the difference between Hebrew and Yiddish. I'm pretty sure Yiddish is, know- has got a German base. Yet, well, Yiddish is a high German derived language, in- historically sp- spoken by the, uh, the Ashkenazi Jews. Well, I, I know in, uh, I don't know what circle is in German, but I know circle in Yiddish is Keikel. Yeah. Uh, it says it's a German based vernacular fused with elements taken from Hebrew and Aramaic, as well as Slavic languages and traces of Romance languages. Yeah, the thing is, it's got all those nasty uh, glottal, gl- guttural sounds in it. Yeah. Uh, it could also be violent. You don't know what damage or harm I could do if I were roused. I could kill you all, but I won't. Oh, and he also said, I'll split the atom. I'm the fifth dimension. I'm the eighth wonder of the world. The fifth dimension? What's that supposed to be? I don't know. I'll split the atom as well is a weird one, isn't it? Because um, this is 31. Well, that's, I, I assume that's what, he, what he's on about, because you've got your three dimensions of space, the fourth dimension of time, and then what's the fifth? Ooh. Is that different reality? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know how to conceptualise it. I don't know if he's talking about splitting the atom is a fifth dimensional thing. I, I don't know how you measure it mm. because I don't know what f- the fifth dimension is. But I assume uh, that those two statements are related to one another. Yeah, it does seem weird, doesn't it? Don't 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 some people surmise stuff about uh, that the atom atom bombs create a portal into hell or something like that, don't they? Well, have you ever seen the um, the, the the slow motion footage of an atomic bomb? No, it wasn't an atomic bomb. Actually, it was the dust cloud. It when the World Trade Center towers uh, blew down, and there's the devil's face in it. Um, but I could have well imagine something that powerful opening up some sort of portal. Mm. I mean, for all we know, this stuff is actually tapping into a, 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 a you know a hell-like realm, and that's where all the fire and poison for radiation comes from. Well, I'll tell you what I found while I was uh, looking at this. Have you ever heard of Project A Double One Nine? Never. Uh, it was also known as a study of lunar research flights. It was a top secret plan developed in 1958 by the US, US Air Force. The aim was of the project was to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. 
which would help in answering some of the mysteries in planetary astron- astronomy and astrogeology. Ah, well, um, whilst they never, I don't think they ever did that because it's like that would be a, a breach of um, the nuclear, no, the space weapons proliferation or something like that. Uh, I think it was supposed to be stru- space- it was supposed to be some sort of flex because it also says if the explosive device detonated on the surface, not in the lunar crater, the flash of explosive light would have been faintly visible to people on Earth with their naked eye, a show of force resulting in possible boosting of domestic morale in the capabilities of the United States, a boost that was needed after the Soviet Union took an early lead in the space race. Well, the thing which I found interesting about it is it was, um, what, 10 or so years ago, they crashed a probe into the moon and they found that the, the moon was hollow like a bell. So you imagine a vast bell the size of the moon being struck by a tiny hammer, which is this probe. Mm. And that's why I suspect all the planets are hollow. So it but says anyway, here, it says the project was never carried out, being cancelled prominently... Primary out of, out of a fear of negative public reaction with the potential of militarization of space as it would would, would also have signified because the moon landing would undoubtedly be a more popular achievement in the eyes of the American and international public alike. A similar project by the Soviet Union also never came to fruition. But um, do you ever listen to um, Horus White Rabbit Radio? Uh, no, not really. I <laughs> he says I get to the point. He said, basically, he says he says quite often that, that, that there is a there, that there is a <laughs> he sa- he says quite often that there's a, like a space detente. So there's like some sort of unwritten rule where, like, when it comes into going into space, that everybody works together. Oh, okay. Because th- there is like things for international cooperation and weapons proliferation in space. So I think even though there was talk of the uh, tungsten rods, the kinetic round, so technically not an atomic bomb, but still uh, a bad idea. Um, they they didn't do any of that stuff. Uh, you ever heard of a band called Lemon Demon? I remember the Lemon Heads, but not Lemon Demon. No. Well, apparently, Le- Lemon Demon did a song called Eighth Wonder, in which some of um, Jeff's favorite Jeff's favorite uh, lines are in there. Uh, so oh. just Too reading. Bad we couldn't play that out. I mean, YouTube would just, you know, the AI would get on it immediately. Be on it like a car bonnet. That's it. So what they're saying is they're saying this could have been. Have you? Have you ever heard of the the story Ricky Tiki Tavi from um from uh, Ricky Tiki Tavi? It was written by Rudyard Kipling. Oh no! I, I remember the just so stories, but not that one. Yeah, I think there's um, what what they say is that uh, it could have been inspired by Ricky Tiki Tavi, which was about yeah, a talking mongoose then, that it, that guarded a family. What was what was that inspired by? Because I'm starting to feel like you, you know, in fiction there is glimmers of truth. Yeah, hold on, I'll find out about Ricky Tiki Tavi. Go on Snopes to get the really boring version of it. <laughs> I'll just go Wikipedia. Uh, it's a short story in the 1894 anthology, The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling, about the adventures of a valiant young Indian mongoose. So it's just, hmm, thinky face. <laughs> I wonder I wonder in their mm. empty farmhouse if they have a copy of Ricky Tiki Tavi in there. What, they were reading the Jungle Book when they had no tele or gramophones in this system. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, this is the bit. Price also discovered, when Harry Price was looking around, Price also discovered an inter- interesting feature of the Irvin's farmhouse. All, in- all interior rooms of the old stone structure were double-walled with wooden panelling. A generous airspace left between the stone and wood walls helped retain heat in winter also makes the whole house one great speaking tube with walls walls like sounding boards. By speaking into one of the many apertures in the panels, it should be possible to convey the voice to various parts of the house. However, this was disappointingly never tested by Price Lambert or any other investigators. It would have been a relatively simple matter for one investigator 
to stand at the top of the stairs speaking while an associate stood elsewhere in the house observing the sound and how it travelled round the house. So it's kind of... You still there, Hobbit? I'm with you. <laughs> so it's kind of... It's, it's a really... While I, while I like this story is it's kind of weird. It, it falls between every single stool, doesn't it? It's really weird, isn't it? I've got to say that I'm st- I'm still sort of uh, trying to piece together in my mind like a Rubik's cube, fifth dimension, and split the atom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Paul World is saying, obviously, if Jeff did get the bus, then someone would have would have interviewed and documented the driver and other witnesses. But there is nothing apparently. Well, the the Manx people are very um, private, and apart from the tourist trophy, don't like any intrusions into their island. So let's just blame it on their uh, obsession with secrecy. Yeah, it's kind of weird. And also the girl kind of went to her grave, because the fairy girls fessed up, didn't they? Do you remember the girls that faked the fairy sightings? Well, they say they faked them, but I like to believe they were real. <laughs> But they um they fessed up in the end, didn't they? Yeah, and I, somehow I'm still thinking to myself that you, you know what that stuff is real. So even if they did fake it, I'm still going to say it's. Real. Oh, but Hobbit, that's unscientific of you. You're saying you're literally believing fibs. <laughs> yes. Well, sometimes you have to be uh, a little bit, don't you? Uh, so they're saying that Nandor Fodor happily accepted rumours and hearsay in place of actual evidence. Concluded, he concluded that Jeff was a mongoose who would learn to talk. Yeah, I'm willing to believe that as well. But like I said, I feel there's a this concerted effort in this world to make it seem more mundane, everything explained, and that there's no mysteries whatsoever. Yeah, it's a, like I say, the, the, the reason I like this one is because it's not like your standard um, poltergeist thing, although there are poltergeist elements. So there's something to do with somebody had um, which one was it? somebody had pins shot at them through the, through the holes in the walls. How bizarre. Yeah, it's just like... Uh, oh, there's a slander case to do with it as well. In 1937, Lambert... I don't know who the Lambert guy is. Ah, he's the one who bought the farm after the family left. Oh, is he? Oh, so in 1937, Lambert brought an action for slander against Sir Cecil Leviter after Leviter suggested to a friend that Lambert was unfit to be on the board of the British Film Institute. Leviter said Lambert was off his head because he believed in the talking mongoose and the evil eye. Lambert was pressured to abandon his action by Stephen Tallant. So Stephen, Stephen Talents, but persisted with it and won in receiving 7,600 quid in damages. 1937, that would have been a fair old wedge, wouldn't it? I mean, even now, that's a sizable chunk of money. Yeah, then, then an exceptional figure for a slander case, awarded because Lambert's counsel managed to introduce his BBC memo, which showed Lambert's career had been threatened if he persisted with the case. The case has been known as the, become known as the Mongoose case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. So th- uh, there is actually documentation of it then. Yeah. But um, not really, because Lambert. Apart from the family. Uh, so, it, yeah. Usually it... so it was um, July 1935, the editor of The Listener, Richard S. Lambert, known as Rex, and his friend Harry Price. So he went with Harry Price to the Isle of Man and helped produce the book, The Haunting of Cashin's Gap. Uh, so then, but that that speaking tube thing's quite interesting, isn't it? Do you think that's, do you think that's possible? Uh, it, it is possible in certain places where you can have like uh, you know fun acoustic effects, like some I think monasteries or other old buildings. It's uh, some, is it some pools but... where the whispering gallery is? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You've got whispering corners and you speak into it and it goes across the entire room. I think that's possible in like a farmhouse, which is kind of like, which I assume is 
uh, well, all I'm thinking is it works a bit like I'm thinking it works like the resonant chamber in a guitar or violin, and so that it amplifies any sound that goes into it because the strings alone don't make much noise. Mm. There's a picture of the. I'll just put in general a picture of the farmhouse. So that's what the house looked like. Geth and the amazing farmhouse. Hmm. So, what else have we got? So, what they basically, as most people say, is the girl was a girl was a ventriloquist. But then again, that's what they normally do. They just norm normally say that 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 kid over there is, who's about eight. <laughs> it's is a it's one it, gas. Yes, <laughs> that kid that kid over there is about eight. Is is a is a world world class ventriloquist. We can fool no, anybody. No, that, that eight year old that eight year old child doesn't exist. It's just swamp gas. Uh, and and weather balloons. Did you know the Soviet Union made a made a film film about uh Ricky Tiki Tavi? <laughs> no. Um but then again I don't really watch much uh, Russian films. I saw Solaris, <laughs> which I thought was quite good. Apparently, there's an anime television series called Jungle Puck Shonen Mowgli. Um, I, uh, no comment because I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, shonen just mean, means kids' animation. I don't know. I, I mean, I've heard the term before, but I don't know what it means. So uh, then you've got uh, Harry Price, who was quite an interesting bloke. Um, so I think we we're about done with this one, are we, Hobbit? I I mean, there's not not much more to say unless you've got anything else to add. Because again, you you told me it's like, hey, do you know about Geth the talking mongoose? And all <laughs> I could say was, why is he called Geth? <laughs> it's called Jeff. I don't know why. I don't know why he called himself Jeff and spelled it with a G. Uh, again, it's a, it's a Manx plot. It is to try and get us to pronounce words the wrong way. Yeah, as well as that of Wari, which is actually the Manx for Mary. <laughs> I, I, I I disavow. So they had the kid before they moved to the Isle of Man, then. Yeah, I'd like to know in what circumstances. I mean, you said they're skinned, but it doesn't really give much more details. So it's like, oh, let's what, sell up and then get a cheap house in the apartment? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, wee baboo tells me Shunin is a magazine. They mainly target teens, but they have mangas targeted at adults as well. Uh, Harry Price was a fraud, apparently. Do Loch Ness. Yeah, but they all they all say that, don't they? Yeah, they do. Oh, did you see Stash popped in earlier? Stash box? Yeah. Stash Prada, who we had on last week. Oh yeah, him. Hello yeah, he Stash in. Prada, so if you still just listening. for a minute I was thinking like Stavros or something, I thought I don't know any Greeks. No, Stash said he was what did he say? He said he's on another show tonight. Uh he said he's on. Oh, he's, he hasn't said what he's on. He says, I'm on later, EST USA, talking precognitive paranoia. <laughs> Unless that must be his, that must be his channel. Uh, so I'd recommend anyone go to Stash, Stash's channel. He's a pretty cool guy, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I mean, I enjoy talking movies with the guy. I just, uh, yeah. Well, this is the thing I. I Again, I'm not one of these sort of people that's well read on this stuff. So when you tell me, it's great because I hear it for the first time and I can literally be like the audience of you don't say really. Then I could do a bit of speculation. Should we do some speculation? Uh, let's do, let's do let's do some speculation. You've heard you've heard all the facts. Do you want to do do you want to do myth busted or confirmed? Do you want to do something like that? I, then I, a bit. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, all right, let's do speculation before we get, uh, you know, debunked and uh, the term yeah. that makes me cringe. Swamp gas uh, over gate, the Venus. Think, yeah, it's swamp gas over Venus. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. it's just an apparition. It's the wind blowing in the gaps in the the air the air duct of their house. Or and the girl who's actually, an expert who's an expert ventriloquist. Or or alternatively, it's a creature what did come from India, New Delhi of all places, and made its way to Isle of Man through uh, circumstances I'd love to know. And Maybe that's what he like means a, by he's from the fifth dimension. Maybe he travelled there through the fifth dimension. I'm starting to wonder now if, if this is like he's, he was Hindu in a previous life, so he's been cursed to be a mongoose in this life. As Hindus get this feeling that, um, you know, based on how you behave, you come back as a lesser or higher being. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think there is something to it, or um, it, it's certainly unique. I mean, it's not somebody who's just like read something and then just like. But then again, is it? I mean, she could have been in that farmhouse reading Ricky Tikki well, Tavi, and then. Again, yeah, I'm thinking Ricky Tikki Tavi. By the way, as an aside, can you hear the fans wearing away on my computer? Uh, it's a bit buzz, but that's about oh. it. There's a faint hiss in the. Oh, crackle. fair enough. Yeah, they're fairly. So noisy, basically, but, basically um, they had two, they had two books in the farmhouse: "Teach Yourself Ventriloquism" and "Ricky Tiki Tavi." Oh, uh, Paul World <laughs> says that uh, mongooses were introduced to the Isle of Man for. Aren't they mongoose? Well, I'm wondering. If it, yeah, what is the plural of a mongoose? <laughs> is it a mongoose? Mongooses. Mongoosei. <laughs> Mongoosei. Mongoosei. <laughs> Mongoose. Well, it's Mongoose, isn't it? I'm pretty sure I've heard this I, argument I, before, and I'm pretty sure it is Mongoose. I'm thinking it's... A, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a Mongoosei. Uh, mon, <laughs> mongoose, I should say. A mongoose. Because Mongoose is just... I mean, it's like saying you've got like more than one mouse plugged into your computer, therefore you've got mouses Mices. plugged into your computer. Yeah. Yeah, it's Mices. Mice. Mongay. Oh, Mongay. Rob Calvert says Mongay. But M Mongays, yes. The Mongays were introduced to Yarn of Man because the, to, to be, this is part of the homosexual agenda. Oh, part of the homosexual agenda. The Jews did it. <laughs> uh, Why not? Sure. Uh, I've, I've got to have a look at this now. Yeah, so do you know Jeff the Mongoose has his own Facebook page? No, but I'm not surprised. Um, creative Wiki. No, they've got wallabies. In 2016, they put wall they put wallabies on the on the Isle of Man. Isn't the wall? Oh no, I'm thinking koala bears. What's a, what's wallaby then? Uh, it's a marsupial, isn't it? That's about all I know. Isn't it just like a smaller ground marsupial? I know it's a marsupial, which means it carries its things in a... It's young in a pouch, doesn't it? Just going to look up wallaby. Oh, it's like a miniature kangaroo. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I have now you mentioned it. I have seen the monge fighting snakes and eating them. Oh, I found, I found another page on, on. For several years in the 1930s, the case of this Manx mongoose, who is said to speak in a range of foreign languages, including Hindustani, as, as well as singing, whistling, and coughing in a human manner. Swearing, dancing, attending political meetings was discussed across Britain. As a fantastical beast, he was a contemporary of Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. He was first supposedly photographed in 1933, although his fame was short-lived. Sometimes he called himself blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, yeah. The Irvings warmed to some of Jeff's ways because he became a pet of sorts who amused the family with his gossip and jokes. He was less eager to share 
these witticisms with outsiders who came to the house and check him out. He didn't like to speak to people who doubted him and, and punished them with silence and insults of insults or threatened to blast them away with a shotgun. Fucking based. Most nice. out of mongoose. Mongoose with a sword off. Uh, so, yeah, because I read somewhere else that Jeff told the girl stuff that she shouldn't have been able to know. Well, I mean, most eight-year-old girls in the 1940s don't know about splitting the atom in the fifth dimension. Yeah, unless that was the other book they had. Mm, yeah. oh, I can't find... Island Mongoose. Oh, I think I might have found it. About mongooses. Uh, conservation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, I can't find anything about them. Uh, that's it. Oh, apparently they, they introduced mongoose to um, Jamaica to kill rats. And I don't know of any problems with that either, because sometimes, like, when rabbits were introduced to Australia, they just run, run rampant. No, not rabbits, um, uh, bullfrogs. Because they think, they think rats were to blame for the um, extinction of the dodo, don't they? Because the, mean, rats, were eat, well, the rats were eating the eggs cause they, cause they, um, because they lay their yeah, eggs on the ground, don't they? Yeah, I mean, the dodo's flightless as well. It's, it's much like these other birds which evolve in relative safety in an island. They just, they turn to crap. Yeah. The, the other thing as well, apparently they, they were quite like horrible and greasy, weren't they? They're apparently yeah, completely inedible. Yeah, they, they weren't good eating. Uh, Wee Babu wants to know if, Mon if you can have a mongoose as a pet. Let's have a look. Are we just talking about mongooses? Mon mon Mongoose? Are we, are we? I can't think of it. Mongoose. Yeah, sure, let's go with it. <laughs> Mongo Can I keep on a mongoose as a pet? They're pretty evil looking. They're cute looking little critters, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I quite like weasels and spokes. So, the mongoose is a member of the civet family, smaller than a domestic cat, but larger than a squirrel. Uh, this kind of all preys on small rodents, birds, and reptiles, but it, and it can threaten the ecological bal balance of a habitat. Ah, I think on Tuesday we were talking about the civets because someone was asking, "What's that creature, the cat which eats um, coffee beans and excretes them?" That's the civet. Oh, is it? I think the yeah, civets. Civ the civets civ a geni, though, isn't it? Well, I don't know about that, but I know civet coffee is the most expensive in the world, and it, apparently it's very good Ooh. because the civets only eat the um, they only eat the ripe coffee beans, and they uh, they leave the other ones. So they don't digest the beans inside; they get washed off and roasted. Oh, they say so. The uh, is, so they said if you befriend a young mongoose in the wild, where he's free to come and go and socialize with humans and other mong mongooses, they use mongooses in this as well. You'll have a good friend who will help keep your house free of pests. Take him out of his native habitat, confine him to a cage and limit his associations to humans, and he might not be so consistently friendly. Not all your friends will enjoy having a mongoose run up their legs, <laughs> sit on their shoulder or chat in the air and nip them if they try to touch them. So they are kind of, I think they're pretty ferret-like. Yeah, I mean, that that sounds about right, don't, don't it? I mean, mm. you know... You go ferreting for it. Do you ever watch those videos of ferreting on YouTube or where they, they get uh, dogs ratted? No. I've known people that if have done ever, it though. I mean, if you're ever bored or something, just watching a video of like 100 rats being um, like chased by uh, Jack Terriers and other dogs, <laughs> very satisfying. Have you ever seen any, any of those things where, where like, uh, there's like, it's at night and there's like a carpet of like mice or rats running across a farm? Have you ever seen that? Ooh, nasty. Yeah. Because apparently there was a problem. Uh, I can't remember where the farms were, but there was a problem with um, with farms where they were um, where they were just like stripping barns. Rats were just, just like eating barns, stripping them, like because there was that many of them. 
crazy. Fancy doing Loch Ness Hobbit next? Yeah, we can do Loch Ness. Ah, now Loch Ness, that will tie into... Uh, I reckon the, the, the lock is actually a, a portal into the Hollow Earth. Because has anybody plumbed the depths of Loch Ness? We shall find out in our research next week. Yeah, so tune in, what, next next week we're doing it? Or the yeah, we'll do it next after? week. We'll do it next week. Or do right, I, I'm up. How long do you want for, yeah, how long do you want for research? One or two? Uh, I did say to a friend, like, we're going to spend, like, a... I, I challenged him. He said he's bored. So I said, well, here's a software synthesizer you can get. Let's challenge each other to make a 10-second long song using it. When are so you getting to come on and talk about the Loch Ness Monster? I'll, I'll ask if he wants to come on, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'll, I'll see what he says. Bring a bit of research. <laughs> Bring a research party. <laughs> But at the same time, he is, he is I, I fucking love science type, so I doubt I'd be interested in it. Oh, is it Capstan? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's not actually Capstan. It's, uh, you don't know him. Right, so we're doing, we're, doing, we're doing Loch Ness next. We're doing it. So. Oh, yeah, looking forward to that. And I think we've done, and it's good night from us, and it's good night from the, well, what is he? The The... The eighth wonder of the world, the splitter of the atom, and the other thing he said he was as well. And the fifth dimension. Oh, yes. Paul World. Uh. Hello, Paul chat. World said Sorry, he knows about Luck Ness. Be... Wow, Paul World, do you want to come on? Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know Capstan wants to... Um, I know Capstan would do, would do a um, what's Dunblane? I know Capstan would do a Dunblane with us. Oh, what? Where the record's been sealed for ninety nine years? Yeah. So I think even Capstan's um, suspicious of that one. So anyway, that's us done. Night all. Good night.